and in track and field at UGA for four years, uh, and it comes from a track family. Jerry's, Jerry, I hope I have this right. Your dad was a longtime head track coach at University of Florida, not Georgia. Okay, got that right. <laughs> yeah, just checking. Uh, leading up to a long stint uh, at 11 Alive, Jerry has worked in TV in Columbus, Georgia, Huntsville, Alabama, and Greenville, South Carolina markets. Since joining 11 Alive, Jerry's worked as the Athens Bureau Chief, the General Assignment Reporter, Investigative Reporter, the Commuter Dude, and currently ser serves as a Y guy. Are y'all still doing Y guy? No. Okay. Okay. Old bio. My apologies. <laughs> Uh, over the years, he's covered events like the 1996 Olympic Park bombing, the value jet crash in the Everglades, and the massive flooding in South Georgia in 1994. Jerry raised three children in the Atlanta area. They all graduated from Dunwoody High School, and all three attended the great university of the University of Georgia, as Jerry's wife, Katie, did as well. And Katie's with us today. Hi, Katie. Yeah, yeah. Just a little bit more. When Jerry's away from work, Jerry volunteers at this place, Dunwoody United Methodist Church. And Jerry is a member of the Friends and Christian Growth Sunday School class. Robert? Yeah, there you go. Uh, and we're blessed regularly, regularly with the breadth of his faith and the ability, his ability to communicate that. It is astonishing. His hobbies include hiking and reading and most of all, keeping me up with four grandkids. And one is due soon, real soon. So that'll be five. Uh, Jerry's a rabid fan, obviously, of the Bulldogs, the Falcons, the Braves, the Hawks, and Atlanta United. He's a prostate cancer survivor who works with several organizations to make men aware of the risk of the disease. Hello? Yeah. And I've been lucky enough to hear a bunch of Jerry's stories, both professional and personal. And I can tell you that you're blessed this morning. He's a committed follower, and he's so and it's so cool to hear how his faith is lived out both professionally and personally interesting note jerry usually gets up at 1 a.m goes to bed at 6 p.m just breathe that in for a minute um he got to sleep in today so join us join me in welcoming our friend jerry carnes I've unmuted this mic. Is it working? Can you hear me? All right. I made sure it was on mute when we were singing happy birthday. You don't want to hear my singing voice. If I didn't know any better, if I'd listened to that bio and didn't know who he was talking about, I'd be pretty impressed. But I know the guy he's talking about, and I'm not that impressed. Um, I appreciate you um, trusting me with this next. Uh, I'll try to keep this down to four or five hours. Everybody's got some time. No, I, 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 just, I really do appreciate you trusting me with this time this morning. Um, I'll try to make it worth your while. When the word got around that, that I was going to be here this morning and I was going to speak. A couple of people, including my wife, asked me what my theme was going to be. And uh, my immediate reaction was I didn't know I needed a theme, so I better come up with something. Since my wife's here, I'm not going to go with uh, struggling through marriage. We're going to abandon that idea. And uh, I'm kidding. Uh, my wife is, has been my biggest cheerleader and supporter for uh, 38 years now, so uh, she gets a lot of credit for for helping me through. Uh, there have been, been many times I wouldn't have blamed her for walking out the door, or well, no, telling me to walk out the door, because uh, this job that I have is, is, uh, is a challenge, and that's going to kind of be my focus this morning. I wanted to when I understood that I do need a theme, I, I, I want to talk about how God reveals himself in our struggles. And not just our struggles, but in the struggles of others. And, and I want to kind of go through some experiences I've had in life, both as a, uh, as a news reporter and, and as a father and grandfather and son. Um, and it, I, I want to start by reading a couple of Bible verses, because I think this kind of will set the theme for what I want to talk about for the next little bit. Uh, there's a, a verse from Romans that says, we also glory in our sufferings because we know that suffering produces perseverance perseverance, character, and character, hope. I'm not good at memorizing Bible verses, so I'm not good at memorizing anything. So I, I apologize for having to read it here, but this, this is another one of my favorites from James. Consider it pure joy, my brothers and sisters, 
whenever you face trials of many kinds, because you know that the testing of your faith produces perseverance. So that's kind of what I'm going with today is to talk about how we all struggle in life and God can reveal himself. Um, I don't want to make you think that my job is a struggle, but I am at the stage in my life with five, about to have uh, my daughter up in Charlotte's about to have our fifth grandkid. My priorities have changed lately. Um, I, I want to spend more time. Am I wandering around too much? Andy? Okay. Um, okay. Okay. Um, hi, everybody. Uh, I, I, I'm about to enjoy the birth of my fifth grandchild. And, you know, I'm just at that stage of life where my priorities have changed. And I'd like the freedom to go see them. I guess what I'm trying to say is I want to quit work. But uh, <laughs> we all want that. My bank account's not in agreement with me on that right now. But, it, it, you know, I, I I think that we all struggle in our jobs at, from time to time. And my my struggles with my work um, are, are not any different. Or they're not any more challenging than what you're facing. But they are a bit unique because as a television news reporter, you you often – encounter situations that are a little bit different. Um, whenever people are running away from the coast to get away from a hurricane, I'm going into it. When people are escaping a gas leak, I'm the one going into it. Uh, I kind of run opposite from everybody else. And you, and you encounter a lot of tragedy, a lot of sadness, a lot of grief. And in my case, it, it really over the 41 years of my career has kind of piled up on my heart and it has been a struggle to deal with that. So um, I, I kind of want to take you to a moment when, and this has been some years ago, just as an example of a struggle that I witnessed and how God revealed himself there. There was a situation with a man who, for whatever reason, never really got an explanation. He decided to intoxicate himself with various substances and drive down Highway 78 from Stone Mountain to Snellville, intentionally ramming into other vehicles. This is what I deal with. Um, he, of course, caused damage to more than a dozen cars and killed a woman. And my role that day was to report on as many of the victims and what they experienced as I could, including the family of this woman who died. Now, the story at the end of the day was this woman. And what a loving, kind, generous woman she was and what she meant to her family. Um, she sacrificed her comfortable life in the country where she lived to follow her daughter and son-in-law to the United States, to Atlanta, to help them raise their family. So she gave up her life over there to help them establish a new life in the United States. And she was just beloved throughout her community. And I found that out by going to her apartment and speaking with some people who knew her. It's a very uncomfortable situation for a news reporter to walk up to people who were at their lowest and say, hey, do you want to do an interview to talk about this woman? Of course, sometimes people just say, I can't do it. In this situation, they were perfectly willing to talk openly about this woman who just meant so much to them. They wanted folks to know what she was all about. So this man invited me in. I think he was a, a cousin or a nephew, invited me into the apartment. And I was sitting on a couch alone in a room, waiting for him to go find someone willing to sit down and do a television interview and find some pictures of this woman. And as I sat there, I didn't realize in the very next room was a whole gathering of this woman's family. And they were very quiet. And as I sat there and sat there, all of a sudden, they just started crying. The grief overtook them. And they just started wailing. And man, did I feel uncomfortable. And I thought, I just need to leave this place. I don't belong here. I need to go. But on the other hand, this man was being very kind to me and was in the process of searching for pictures and someone I could interview. And I thought it'd be rude to leave. So I just sat there, didn't know what to do. And finally, it struck me, I just need to pray. And I bowed my head. And I asked God to fill that house with peace and comfort and understanding for this family. And like a light switch, the crying stopped. And I felt God's presence in that place like I'd never felt before. I mean, I had never before that experienced anything like it. And the story I produced that night was one of this woman's 
love and kindness for her community and her family. And it just turned out really much more than just a story of a crazy guy driving down the street, ramming into people. It, it was, it really went to the heart and character of this woman. And, and, and I went home that night and all I could think about was God entering that house and giving these people peace. So that was one of those moments where another family struggles, God revealed himself to me and to them. The, the issue with my work has been 41 years of encounters like that, that no matter how fulfilling it was, I took home a little bit of that family's grief. And I've been doing it for 41 years. Um, it piles up on you. And in 2011, I lost my dad to cancer. And all of a sudden, the grief that I was encountering from other people uh, kind of collided with my own grief, which I didn't fully understand at the time. I mean, I was uh, just not in a position to really fully grasp how much I was grieving and how much it hurt. So a couple of years later, <clears throat> I went to my bosses and I said, listen, I can't do this anymore. I've either got to find another line of work or I've got to make a change at work. Something's got to, I can't keep going out and doing these stories about other people hurting. I'm hurting too much. And they gave me a, let us think about it. There's really not another position. We really don't know what to move you to. And I asked a couple more times and kind of kept getting pushed aside. And, and, I, and I talked to Katie about maybe leaving television news that maybe it was the time. This is in 2013. This was 10 years ago. And it just wasn't happening. There was no movement. And one day I went into work and there was a guy at the time, you may remember, maybe not a, an anchor that we had in the mornings named Ted Hall. And Ted was facing his own struggles. Ted's son had a brain tumor. And I walked in the door and there was Ted. He and I had a chat and I said, how are you doing? And he said, not good. Um, this job's too much. I can't deal with my son and, and the stuff that we deal with here at this job. I just, I, I'm either going to have to leave the business or maybe just move to a smaller town where the stress is not, not as much as it is here. And I told him I'm going through a lot of the same things. So we, our editorial meeting was about to happen. And I just went and found myself a quiet spot in the, uh, in the building. And I prayed for Ted and I prayed that God would bring him answers. And, um, you know, bring some answers and, and heal his son. And I, I mean, I was hurting for Ted in that moment. Forgot all about my own issues. And and because his was, you know, his, his son had brain a brain tumor and didn't know what was going to happen, what the future held. And, and I thought that puts things in perspective. He's hurting a lot worse than I am. Walked back into the newsroom. My boss was waiting for me. And she said, I need to talk to you. We've got a guy leaving. And I think that his role is one that you would fit and it'd be different from all the things. He, basically, right then, I walked out of that prayer to what I'd been waiting for. And my job changed that day. Now, the caveat was that I moved to the morning shift, which is why I'm still getting up at one o'clock in the morning. Yeah. I was willing to make that trade. The one mistake I made, I agreed to do all this without consulting somebody who's in this room right now. <laughs> and I got an earful that night, if I remember correctly. I understand why you're doing it. Why didn't you ask me first? She has gotten used to my morning. What, have you gotten used to it? No, you haven't. Okay. She has put up with my morning shift. But that was another moment God revealed himself. He's, he said, I'm here for you, Jerry. And I'm here for Ted too. And Ted ended up moving to uh, Knoxville, Tennessee. And he's much happier. His son is fine. And God answered both of our prayers. I lost my dad, as I say, in 2011. In 2017, I lost my sister to breast cancer. That was too much. Um, my sister was only 54 years old. She suffered for 15 years. I say suffered. You never really saw Nancy suffer. She never complained. But she had breast cancer four different times. It, it supposedly was gone, and then it came back, gone, and came back. Finally, in 2017, um, it just spread through too much of her body, and she passed away. And Katie and I uh, have gotten to where we take hikes and sometimes we'll go up in the mountains and hike the Appalachian trail. And we were hiking a section of the Appalachian trail. It ends up on top of a mountain where it's called preacher's rock. If you've never been there, if you're a hiker, I recommend it. We got to the top of preacher's rock and this is where 
apparently like a hundred years ago, this a church congregation used to gather there and the preacher would deliver his sermon from Preacher's Rock. And it was just such a, I don't know, just the, the mood I was in. It just, I felt so good. And I, I said, Katie, I'm going to hike a section of this trail to honor my dad and my sister. That was one of those moments she said, I've married the wrong guy. I should have looked a little harder before agreeing to this, but eventually she warmed to the idea, or at least she let me go on what was supposed to be a 120 mile hike over 10 days with the idea being, I'm doing this to honor two loved ones who've passed away from cancer. That was the original intent. I got carried away with the idea of hiking the Appalachian Trail and how far could I go? So when I started on this journey, God needed to do a little humbling. He needed to make me realize that this was not about how many miles I could hike, but the purpose of the hike, which in, uh, honestly was to, to honor my dad and my sister, but also to get in touch with God and find some answers. What are the answers I needed? Well, I'll discuss two of them. I was not only suffering from grief over the losing them, but guilt as well. Um, they, they both at the end suffered a lot and I witnessed it. I had cancer in 2018, uh, I'm sorry, 2008. I've had colds worse than this cancer. I'm telling you, I didn't, I never felt bad. I was diagnosed. I had the same cancer as my father, which is prostate cancer. I never, I never hurt. I was told you can have surgery. You can go these other routes. I said, I'll have surgery. I was diagnosed in August of 2008. I had surgery in November, gone, nothing. Haven't had a, no sign of cancer since then. And I couldn't help but feel guilty over how hard they had it and how easy I had it. I just thought it was unfair. The second thing I needed to resolve with God was my relationship with my dad. Um, my father truly lived the kind of life that I think Jesus wants us to live. He, he was always there for people who needed to be lifted up. He lived out Jesus's commandment that we serve the least of these. And he did it every day of his life. He was such a humble man and he always loved others. So he lived out that commandment that Jesus gives us, always loved, loved his neighbors. But he never expressed anything about his relationship with Jesus. And I never asked him. I don't know why. I just was too busy. And I never sat down and had a conversation about faith with my dad. Even at the end, when I was trying, when he's on his deathbed and couldn't communicate any further, I was trying my best and fumbling around, you know, making this last minute attempt to talk about faith. So when my father passed away, I didn't know where he was going. I thought, surely a man like this deserves heaven, but I didn't have that assurance. So I was confused. I was guilty. I was grieving. And so I'm hiking this trail looking for these answers. And the only answer God is giving me is you're not as good a hiker as you thought you were. You really honestly thought you were going to hike 120 miles in 10 days with 35 pounds on your back up these mountains. Yeah, you're not doing that. It took a couple of days. Well, no, it didn't take a couple of days. It took the first day. Um, Katie went with me to Amicalola Falls. Anybody been there? Beautiful, gorgeous part of the state. Mm -hmm. There's an eight and a half mile approach trail before you begin the Appalachian Trail. You started at Amicalola and you hike eight miles. Katie and I walked, did a little quick walk on the approach trail, and the sign said, um, strenuous, strenuous, strenuous. And she's going, it, this is going to be strenuous. <laughs> and I said, no, that's for the, look at these kids and parents. So that, you know, that, that's for all those people. That, that, that's not addressing hikers like me. Yeah, it was. Um, I had my son's Boy Scout backpack on. And I got four miles into this eight mile approach trail and I realized I had bitten off way more than I could chew. The first eight months, that, that eight miles is up Springer Mountain. The top of Springer Mountain is where the Appalachian Trail begins. I about quit that day, but I'm like, nope, I'm out here for a reason. 
the next four days was filled with God humbling me further and further and further. And he needed to do that with me so that I would listen when he was finally time to address the questions that I had. I needed to clear my head of all of this nonsense about how far I could hike and how tough a hiker I was and what an outdoorsman. Finally, I got to the point where I understood. And I was walking um, Blood Mountain. There's mountains all over that, at the Appalachian Trail, by the way. It's basically just a series of mountains, one right after the other. I'm hiking Blood Mountain in the pouring rain, and people are passing me left and right, 80-year-old men, you know, just everybody's going by me, and I didn't care anymore. Um, Blood Mountain's a tough hike, especially in the rain, and I got about halfway up, and I'm shaking my head going, boy, I'm nowhere near as in good a shape as I thought I was, and I, I had to sit down and rest, and so I sat on a rock. And once again, another one of those moments where just every ounce of space around me was filled with God. And he answered me by simply saying, Jerry, I've got this. Don't worry. You don't need to worry about your dad anymore. You don't need to worry about your sister. They are taken care of. Let me handle it. And it wasn't an audible voice. I can't even tell you. It just, those words filled my heart. And I'm not going to say that my backpack felt a lot lighter from that point on, but certainly there was a weight off of my shoulders that day. And my struggles, God was there. One final story, and I know you might have questions, so I'll open it up after that. But fast forward to just last year, and I'm thinking once again about how I'm in my 60s, I've been on television for 40 years. People have seen enough of me. Maybe it's once again time to find another job. There was a, a, an opportunity to work in communications with a Christian-based nonprofit. And it seemed to be a perfect fit. I didn't see the little things that would make me understand it wasn't really a perfect fit. I was ignoring that and looking at the things that did make it a perfect fit. And I thought, this is going to work out. And so... We were on a trip, and um, I was thinking about this, and the people who were doing the hiring were thinking about it, and I said, I'll, you know, we'll, we'll discuss it when I get back home. So I spent some time on that trip praying, and I said, God, I, I, I think you've created this job for me. Is that right? And this was the answer I got that day. Again, not an audible voice, just my heart filled with this message. And God said, you can serve me anywhere. And I went, well, wait a minute. So no, I'm not this, you, you didn't set up this job for me. This is not, I mean, it looked like the perfect transition from television news to helping serve this nonprofit, this Christian based, based nonprofit where I'd be able to live out my faith and my communication skills. It looked, seemed perfect. You can serve me anywhere. You mean back in television news, you're sending me back there? That was the only message I got. You can serve me anywhere. And I, I got back home and I realized he's sending me back to that newsroom. And sure enough, things kind of fell apart with that other job. It just wasn't the perfect fit I thought it was. And ever since then, I've kept that message in my head. You can serve me anywhere. And I've been trying to focus on how I can serve him in that newsroom. Mentoring young reporters, not just as a television news reporter, but as a Christian and helping them in their struggles. So those are some of the ways that God has revealed himself in my struggles. You may have similar stories, but that's that's mine. So with that, I'm happy to answer any questions you may have. Hello. Hey. Hello. Hello. Uh, I was lucky enough to, to see you MC the uh, Prostaware Blue Ribbon yeah. Lunch the other day. I know you've done that for quite some time and been able to interview some, some interesting people, the phrase manager, and then I think before that was Brad Nestor. I was just curious, yep. maybe who's your favorite or, or who, who have you had the most fun with? At that event? Yeah, or just really what the event that you've Do what? That you think? Yes, absolutely. So the question was, um, I have emceed an event called Prostaware. It's it's the Blue Ties Luncheon. It's an event that's held once a year. This is Prostate Cancer Awareness Month, by the way, and it's held in September 
to help raise money and spread awareness about the risk of prostate cancer. And I mean, the event over the years has been really spectacular. I've interviewed um, this past, uh, uh, when was it, two Fridays ago, uh, I interviewed, uh, well, um, Brian Snitker, the Braves manager, was the was the main speaker, and he wanted to do it kind of as a sit down, just chat, which I've done the, the last three years, I think. Um, the year before that was Brad Nessler, who does CBS uh, uh, SEC football games. And those are those are right in my wheelhouse. I mean, I could talk all day to Brian Snicker about Braves baseball. I've been a fan since I was 10 years old, which is a long, long time ago. Um, some guy named Hank Aaron was playing at the time. And and Brad Nessler, of course, I love college football. So interviewing him was just absolutely great. If you have a chance to go to that event, please do. Um, but you're are you at you're over the, just in news, who's been the most interesting person? I you know, be hard to be hard to pick. I've I've interviewed um people in prison. I've it's con artists. I've interviewed uh oh gosh, I shouldn't make the transition to politicians after mentioning con artists. Um <laughs> I've interviewed several famous politicians, um, uh, met U.S. presidents, including Jimmy Carter. Um, I, it'd be hard to say who, who was the most fascinating. I, sometimes it's just the best interviews that I've ever had have been people who just revealed a part of themselves that you did that surprised you. You know, um, I, I'll, I'll try to make this brief, but I did a story years ago. Uh, there was a plane crash back when ASA was an airline, that tells you how long ago it was, it was in the 90s and there was a plane crash out in Carrollton. Um, it was it was a bad one. This plane crashed in a cornfield, killed several people, the plane caught fire. I was about to end my day when all of a sudden I found myself on the way to Carrollton. And one of the stories that came out of that that I will never forget, and I interviewed these people several times, this couple that lived near the cornfield ran out and they found this young girl badly, badly injured and they stayed with her until the ambulance got there and took her away. They went to the hospital with her. They didn't know this girl at all. She was from Connecticut. They were from Carrollton. They bonded like a family. And one of the most memorable stories I ever did was they invited me to go to the airport there in Carrollton when she was flying back to her family in, in New England. And it was like watching family members saying goodbye to each other. They had bonded that tightly. And it was, it, it, it was just talking to those people the way that they poured out their heart for this young girl who was alone without her family for a while, they just became her family. And those are the stories that, that will stay with me the rest of my life. I want to talk. Okay. Jerry, uh, we talked a lot today about stories that, you know, got to live stuff and read and whatnot, but I imagine over your career, there's also been some pretty hilarious or funny moments uh, in, that you might be able to share with us. Oh, let me think of anything that might be appropriate to tell. <laughs> um, you know, it, 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 yeah, I don't, I'm, I'm trying to think real quick of funny moments. Um, you know, I think I've met a lot of characters over the years and a lot of them have worked in television news, not the people outside. You would think that the characters would all be there, um, but a lot of them have been people I've worked with. I, I don't know how funny this is. I'll tell This is just the first thing that popped into my head. And this will reveal a lot about what I do. And this is, this, you'll either think this is funny or kind of sad, but um, I had, uh, it, it, we got a tip once that um, city of Atlanta garbage trucks we're driving through this neighborhood at four o'clock in the morning and, you know, the dumpster trucks that make all the noise and they were keeping people awake. And so I decided to drive over to this neighborhood at four in the morning and see if I could catch these dump trucks actually doing that. As I'm telling this story, I'm wondering why in the world am I admitting to this? Um, the neighborhood was not the most upscale. And so I'm trying to find a place where I can position the camera <clears throat> and catch the trucks coming down there if they should show up <laughs> there were um let's just say that there there are people out at that time of day who are um the uh, merchants they sell things they have product that they want to um and and they would come out of the bushes i mean I, they would arrive out of the bushes to ask me if i'd like to buy their product and um, 
I would politely tell them that I was just fine in that regard and I moved on. And eventually this homeless man shows up and tells me that none of them are going to hurt me. I'll be just fine. And I, why, why are you here? And I explained it. And he said, oh, yeah, those trucks come through every morning. Just wait a few more minutes and they'll be here. He introduced himself, told me who he was and that he was a burgeoning singer. And at that hour, 4 a.m. begins to serenade me um, in the middle of the street. That's what I do for a living. It was a funny moment. Anyone else? We can talk about Braves baseball, Georgia football. I could talk about those things all day long. Ooh, Paul. My goodness. If I could change the news business. Um, that is a terrific question. And there are so many legs to that. Um, I have been in it, as I say, 41 years, and it has changed quite a bit. It's changed for, for many reasons. Um, the equipment has changed. The whole approach has changed. You know, when I first started in television news, it was ABC, CBS, and NBC, and CNN was just getting off the ground. So the competition was much different. There was no web, there was no social media, and now we're competing with all of that. And I guess if I had to hone in on one thing, um, social media has changed what we do a lot because there are people who turn to that as their source of news. And I would just ask my colleagues, we don't have to respond to that. We don't have to behave in that manner. We need to stick to what we know is right instead of knee-jerk reactions to what we see on social media. That's one of the challenges that we're facing. We consider that competition when most of it is just a bunch of people chattering in public. That's one thing I would change. Um, we, need to, we need to stick to the basics of journalism, which is to, to, to just dig for the truth and be honest and not, and, and the other thing I'd change is don't make your reporting about you. I see a little too much of that in the young people coming up is that they tend to kind of both on social media and sometimes on air make things about who they are instead of about the people who are impacted by the news. That's kind of my rambling thought, Paul. I hope that even came close to that. I'm not in charge though, thank goodness. Hey, Jerry. Hey. Good, chance to get to see you. Good to see you. Good to see you. this morning. Um, you mentioned that you waited maybe a little too long in the context of talking to your dad. Thanks for that message. Well, you're welcome. Talk about what you're doing with the, the younger generation in the newsroom. Heard that also. How's that going? And what are you doing with your kids now when you think about your grandkids? Oh, boy. Um, not enough with the people in the newsroom. And I think that that's the one lesson I need to take is that instead of beating myself up over what didn't happen with my dad, I need to be sharing more with people at work. Um, the newsroom's an interesting place right now. It's, it's, it's a grind because we're, we, we just started a four o'clock show and that's the one benefit of getting up at one in the morning. I don't have to worry about that four o'clock show. That's long after I'm gone, but it's just, it, it's just an added burden <clears throat> to the reporters who were working day side. And I feel like a lot of times when I talk to them, um, all they want to hear from me is, how can I do this story? Who can I talk to? They're, we're all so busy. It's, it's almost not conducive to a discussion about faith. But those moments when they come, I need to, I need to do a much better job of taking advantage of that. Um, my three kids, I have to say, I'm not worried about them or their grandkids, uh, their kids, my grandkids, because somehow... Katie gets all the credit on this. We have raised three children who are as faithful a kids. As, it, I mean, they are truly, truly dedicated to following the life of a, of a disciple of Jesus. And, and it's amazing to me. They have all done work and, and either on the job or outside the job. They have really done a great job of that. And uh, I don't know what influence I had on that. Probably the best thing I did was just get out of the way and let Katie take control of that. But um, they, they have... They have really been great, but I need to be more. I've been kind of working on myself, 
trying to get my own my own spiritual growth on the right track. And I need to spend more time with people at work because they they the folks in our newsroom need uh, comfort and prayer. And um, so I need to do a better job of that. <clears throat> Thank you for reminding me. <laughs> Anyone else? Yeah, okay. So thanks for all you do for Delaware Baptist Church. I know you're a big in our prayer ministry, a lot of other stuff, babies. Um, what, what do you think about Delaware Baptist Church? Where are we going? How the guys here in this room get involved? Where, where do you see the greatest need, especially around communication, which is your specialty? Um, we are always trying to get more guys, always trying to get more guys involved, always trying to pump things up. Yeah. Any suggestions? Any well, thoughts? I will just say that um, the role that I'm trying to play now is with the missions team and uh, putting together videos to help promote the different missions of this church. And by the way, just to answer one question, this church is going in a great direction. I think Phil is his leadership is just amazing. And, and he's such a humble leader that uh, I, I just, I, I think he has really, really done a lot for the growth of this church. Um, and I've been a member for, for 30 years and I've seen, seen this church go through some rough patches and this is, I feel really good about where we are now, but we have so many missions at this church and, and we need volunteers. In fact, I'm putting together, um, a video right now to help support the community, community assistance centered. It changed names. And Francis is back there who can tell you about, uh, talk to him today about the need because there is um, a slot the third Saturday of every month that um, that uh, CAC needs to, to volunteers from this church to help run that place. And without volunteers for it, they're turning folks away. Saturday is a good day to be there because, you know, that's when a lot of folks have the day free to come by and get assistance with food or clothes. And so it, they've turned to this church to fill that need every third Saturday of the month. So if you're up to doing that, as there's a good volunteer opportunity right now. There are volunteers needed in a lot of places. And so that that's kind of the role I'm playing. And if you feel, you know, feel moved to do something like that, to do a mission and be a part of this church in that regard, there's, there's a lot of great opportunities. Thanks, Jerry. Mm -hmm. uh, we have a question from Michael Bell. Okay. Uh, First of all, he wants to know if he can ask questions. The answer is yes. Yeah, guys, ask away. Um, I'd like to ask, how as a man of faith does he deal with the media, which many executives don't seem to have faith or support or believe in God? Um, I... And is, is the newsroom a very secular place? It seems like when we watch the news, it is a very secular place. It, so, how can I answer that? There are a lot of people in our newsroom who attend church. Um, I, I did a Sunday school lesson on this very thing. I wish I had my notes from that in front of me. But there have been surveys of people in journalism, not just television news, but in newspaper and all sorts. And, and I was very disappointed to see the number of journalists who attend church and then from that, the number who truly consider themselves people of faith. It, it was even lower than I thought it was. So I think that... As a Christian, um, I just try to be a good influence, and I try to show them what what a true person of faith is all about. And I I try to do it not just in my interactions in the newsroom, but also by the approach I take to the stories I put on air. Um, I, I'll tell you this quick story. I don't know if this even helps answer the question, but there was a, a football player in Forsyth County who had a brain aneurysm in the middle of practice one day, and they happened to have trainers there on the scene who went to his aid. They knew what to do. They called an ambulance. His mother, I, this was this all came out during an interview I did with his mother. Um, he was in the Shepherd Center at the time, recovering from this horrible brain injury. And she said, it was just amazing. It was like God came down, put those trainers there to help him, got the ambulance. The ambulance was close enough to get him. She said, the lights, he, all the lights were green to, from there to the hospital, got him there in time, and he's going to be fine. He's struggling right now, but he's going to be fine. She called me later because she was confused at why I was the only one who used 
the part of her interview where you other other stations interview her. And she wondered why I was the only one who used the part where she said God was there. God did this. God lined up the traffic light. She said, I said that to everybody, but you were the only one who used it. And I said, I don't, I don't, I can't answer that. I don't know why I was the only one, but that part of the story moved me. And it, and it probably moved a lot of people who saw the story. The result was that when her son came home, she called me and told me that she said, I'm the only one, I, you're the only one I'm inviting over because I know that, that you will, you will put my devotion to God in your story. You, you will, you will allow me to credit God for what's happened with my son. So, you know, even, even if newsrooms only have a small percentage of people of faith, I think that it's incumbent on me to, to live that out every day. And I'm certainly not afraid to do it. And I've had no boss tell me you need to tone that down. Nowhere along the line has that ever happened. Um, you know, quite the opposite. In fact, I think they've encouraged it. And um, I hope that answers the question. Thank you. Anybody else questions? Um, how did you get into the business and what influences did you have throughout your life? Uh, you into okay, let me think about that. Um, so I... Um, I went to the University of Georgia for the sole purpose of competing in track and field with the notion in my head at the time that I was going to be this spectacular runner who made the Olympic team. My dad coached the 1976 Olympics and was named as the head coach for the 1980 team that if you remember boycotted. Um, so I'm like, this is all going to be great. I'm going to run track for my dad at the University of Florida and then I'm going to run in the Olympic games with him. He succeeded. I didn't. Um, I went a different direction. And, and so I, I went to the university of Georgia. My dad um, got out of coaching at the university of Florida. So there went plan number one. I I'm, I'm not going to go to Florida if, if he's not coaching there. I decided to go to the university of Georgia. My mom and dad, it's not that crazy that I <laughs> didn't go to Florida and went to Georgia. My mom and dad grew up in Eatonton, Georgia. If you know where that is, it's not that far from Athens. And I had two cousins going to the University of Georgia at the time. I was an average high school track runner. The coach at the University of Georgia at the time treated me like a five-star athlete out of respect for my dad, I'm sure. But I decided to go to Georgia. And round about my junior year, I realized I need to prepare for a career outside of college. I'm going to leave here soon enough. Mm -hmm. And while I was in high school, I'd done some announcing at football games and just thought, Maybe journalism will be fun and um, I can get paid to talk for a living. That sounds like a pretty good deal to me. Now, when you make the decision to go into journalism, you have choices. You can decide to go in front of the camera, or behind the camera. I thought I'd feel more comfortable in front of the camera. Then you have a choice of whether you want to be a news reporter or an anchor. News reporters are out in the cold and the rain and they don't get paid that much. Anchors sit in a nice, comfortable room and they get paid 10 times as much. So naturally, I chose the rain and the cold and not getting paid as much. I've had to go back and wonder about a lot of decisions in my life. But to answer your question seriously, I really feel like God designed me to do this job. I might not have thought about that as I was choosing this career, but God wired me with a, a love of telling stories. I love to hear from other people, and I love to share their stories. It is just, I, I mean, I'll have experiences during the day, and Katie and I'll go out for a walk, and I'll spend the entire time telling her about, I talked to this person, and they told me that. It just, I'm constantly listening to what other people have to say and then sharing it. And it just, that that drive has stayed within me. If I didn't do this, I would have done something similar in communication where I was able to share other people's stories. So just being wired that way, I guess just, I, I I really honestly, another factor of it was that when I told my dad that I was going to get into television news, he kind of scratched his head. My dad was one of those guys who never, he just, he wondered about why I did things I did, but he didn't, he didn't argue with me or try to twist my arm and get me to change my mind. And he, he just said, well, if you're going to, if you're going to do that, you need to go talk to Johnny Pruitt. And I said, dad, who is that? He said, well, it's a guy that ran track for me at Druid Hills High School, 
and I realized he was talking about John Pruitt, the main anchor at Channel 11, who is one of the most legendary journalists in all of Atlanta. I'm like, wait, you know John Pruitt? And he put me in touch with John. John helped me get an internship at Channel 11. And here I am. So just little thing. I feel like God just lined these little things up and kind of just directed me. He didn't shove me in that direction, but just sort of, sort of guided me. I have a question for you. Based on your previous story about the boy with the aneurysm and the mother's appreciation of you bringing Christ into the story, uh, as the audience, how how do we help get Christ deeper into the media? Because I know. I think there's some jaded feelings in general about media as the consumers. What can we do to help get Christ back in media and maybe be in prayer? I would say just be encouraging of those journalists who do it um, and express appreciation for that. Um, you know, it, it, as a longtime journalist, I, I, I mean, I do feel pretty beat up. Um, and it's okay. Uh, I, I, I think some of the criticism is deserved as, as I was mentioning, there are young journalists who have looked at this broad landscape and, and, and all of the challenges of the job and have, have tended to lean toward making sometimes themselves more prominent in their reports than and should be. I mean, I was taught that you just weren't, you weren't the story. And unfortunately that, that, um, that rule has kind of crumbled a little bit. It's still there. It's just not followed the way it used to be. And I think when you do that, when you tend to put yourself more at the forefront, you're leaving other things like faith and God behind. And so I would, I don't know what you can do other than to than be encouraging to those who do. Um, and, you know, let, let the news directors and let the, let the managers and news stations know that you appreciate the work of those who are, who are putting faith up front. It's not like I, I can include it in every story, but when, when there's a person of faith who expresses that, I know that I'm going to, I'm going to let that out. Um, you know, you might even write a news station and say you'd like to see regular reports on faith in the community. I, I mean, I might even suggest that because, I mean, it's gotten tough out there. You know, there's a lot of dissension and and maybe we need a little touch of hope regularly. Jerry, uh, is there anything in the education system, university, journalism, schools that get into the ethics or things like that, or is that no, I mean, there's a, you, at UGA, we had to take an ethics class. I mean, a full, there was an ethics law class specifically for journalism and then just an eth a journalism ethics class. And so it's taught, well, it was in 1982. I hope they I assume they're still teaching it. Um, but, you know, so many things have changed over the years. And unfortunately, there are fewer people getting into the business. Um, which is, it, it is, is not good because then maybe some that ought not to be in it are getting promoted just for the lack of it. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, we, we, are, we are taught ethics. And you learn it on the job better than you do in a, in a classroom. Jerry, if I could be in here. Sure. Uh, presentation this morning. Um, a lot of us, when it comes to the national news, which I know I'm sure fairly quick, but um, we're looking for just facts, man, as Friday used to say. Um, news seems like it's so biased these days, depending on which feed you tune into, which channel, either far left or far right. And where do you go to find just facts? What's, what's your take on the national news and where's the most mutual? Um, source. Uh, I, I mean, I can tell you that according to surveys of people, they they look to local news as being less biased than than the national news. Um, 
I don't, I don't get to sample everybody all the time. I, I, I often don't get with my six o'clock bedtime, don't get to see the national news. Um, I'll catch it some snippets of it the next day, but you know, it's, it, it, I don't know how deep to get into this, but I do have, I'll just express that I have a lot of disappointment at the way things have gone on a national level, particularly with cable news. I mean, I, I think that's kind of where things started to fall apart and, and then it's bled into, into other areas. Um, but it has not bled down to the local level as much. And I'm, and I know I'm saying that as a local news reporter, but I, I know the people in our newsroom and I know, you know what, and I know the, people at channel five and two and we're all friends and i know I, I know most of them to be very very good journalists who are just trying just trying to to report accurate accurate news and i also know a few who kind of know how to fudge the facts a little bit and um we know what we know how to approach them when we when we encounter them but but most are very very good at what they do um, you know, Channel 5, Dale Russell just retired recently, and I think journalism in Atlanta took a big hit with that because I I admire I admire him a great deal. He, he was, Dale was very, very good at what he does. And Randy Travis, who's also at Channel 5, and I'm bragging about my competition here, but Randy Travis at Channel 5 and I went to school together, and he's as solid as they come. So I, I would just say local news is is – you know, they're the people who are going to tell the stories that you want to hear anyway, most of the time, because it's going to be about your neighbors. Um, again, I don't get to sample network news as much as I used to. And I and I stay away from cable news altogether. All right, Jerry, I got to know, based on, based on these last four games, do we have anything to worry about? The Raiders will be a good spot. Um, so... This is my theory. I think that they they know they're going to nail down home field advantage and they're just trying out some pitchers and trying out some some things that um, I think everything's going to be fine. I would rather us go on a losing streak now than in the playoffs. Oh, yeah. <laughs> and I and, and I did get to have a conversation with Brian Snicker um, at that event a couple of weeks ago. And I got to say, I, I already liked him as a manager. Man, I like him a lot more now. Just he, he is such a humble guy. And he has built a clubhouse where those guys really enjoy playing together. When you can get a room full of guys like that, oh, man. I remember being in Pittsburgh in 1991 or two when we played the, the um, uh, Pirates. Pittsburgh Pirates. Thank you. I was about to say Phillies. I think the Phillies are on my mind right now. Yeah. Phil, Phil is still on. Okay, Phil. You're not going to like this story, all right? The Pirates, the fans of the Pirates – didn't like that team because it had Barry Bonds and a couple of other players. And they said, we can't relate to those guys. They're just aloof. We don't like them. This Braves team is nothing like that. You've got nobody going around beating their chest. They all like each other. And when, after they won the division, the interviews with them, they were all talking about each other. They were reflecting that same thing, how much they enjoyed being together, how they were eager to get to the clubhouse every day. That kind of team can't go wrong. A little losing streak right here. Yeah, it worries me some especially when we're losing the, the Phillies, but, and the Marlins, for guys sakes, what was that about? I just think that they're tinkering with the team a little bit. I trust Brian Snicker. I think we'll be okay. Now the Bulldogs, if you want to get into that, I'm, I'm, I see a lot of uh, areas where we could improve. <laughs> Questions? You don't often get a chance to talk to the theory folks. Oh, then fly. If I don't know the answer, I will make it up. Thank you. People say they don't hear you. Thank you. Okay, I'm told before we close in prayer, a few more things to announce. Obviously, just a reminder, um, you guys that aren't here regularly on Tuesday mornings, this is a great group. Uh, a lot of great fellowship with the guys, which a lot of us don't get throughout the week. So uh, we'd love you all to come back and join us uh, every Tuesday morning at 7 a.m. to 8 a.m. Uh, obviously, Disciple One 
Pat Morgan, um, see him or look online to get signed up for that pretty quick. Uh, great thing if you have never had a chance to go all the way through the Bible um, and, and critical, to, uh, especially us as men, what we deal with day to day and in our lives. So, uh, and then obviously let us know or anyone at your table, if there's anything we can be in prayer for, for you guys, we'd love to know that. And uh, just uh, thanks again for being here. And again, we'd love to see more of y'all regularly. So um, let me close us in prayer uh, again, Lord God, we thank you for this uh, time to gather. We thank you for Jerry. Thank you for his wife, Katie, and, and what they mean to this community and this church. Uh, thank you for the lessons you put on his heart, Lord, especially that, uh, we can serve you anywhere. May we all be mindful of that. Uh, Lord, we just uh, thank you for being our hands, our feet, our eyes, our hearts, uh, and all that we do. Uh, watch over us and guide us as we go from this place. And may we come back together again. Amen. Amen.
Thank you so much